Well, no doubt you remember from civics, if you had civics, that um, when they set up our government, they set it up to have checks and balances, so no one part was going to be too strong, and that came out of many centuries of living under tyrannical monarchy in England and the kings and queens of Europe. And so it was this idea that we didn't want anyone to have the totality of power over people. And this is not a modern concern. It goes all the way back to any sort of developed society when you have the possibility of a sort of totalitarianism, whether it's political or spiritual. And so you'll notice that when the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah emerge, particularly even right before King Saul, God also gives the people a prophet. God institutes the office of the prophet at the same time the role of the king is developed so that we have a red phone, if you will, to heaven. So when the king, mostly kings, when the kings get involved in faithless behavior, the prophet can stand up and say, this is not what God wants you to do. And you can imagine that in a situation where the kings are kind of running loose and pursuing whatever they want, that when you're the one God calls and says, go tell them to stop doing that, you're not a very popular prophet. Because most of the time people want you to shut up, especially if they're making a lot of money doing what they're doing. And that's what we have in Amos. Amos is one of the minor prophets, so maybe not one that you're that familiar with. He's not minor because he's unimportant, but he's just a smaller prophet. Uh, most of the big prophets are dealing with the problem of exile, and that was a major problem. But in this case, we see one of the prophets having to tell the people that they're misusing God's prosperity. Now, it's not to say that God doesn't want the people to be prosperous. God does. This, this is an important distinction to make throughout. It's not that God doesn't want prosperity. It doesn't that God wants us to be successful or generate wealth. God doesn't want us worshiping our prosperity and wealth and becoming a creature of appetite so that we lose sight of what it means to belong to a larger story. And so what Amos is doing is critiquing the fact that like we had last week at the bottom of Mount Sinai, they're not making a calf, but they are worshiping the gold. And they're worshiping it to such a degree that it's distorting their society. And even the people of the society are becoming commodified. You are exchanging the poor for a cheaper sandal, says Amos. You are changing the weights and measures so that you can maximize short-term profit and the like. And this is God's critique of a kind of economic injustice where the poor are disposed of for the sake of profit generating. And God says, this isn't what this relationship is about. It's not about our communion. And Amos is not a particularly popular prophet. I have a friend of mine that when he teaches the prophets, he goes, I always feel like if I don't have one person walk out of the class on Amos, I probably haven't taught what he said. In the sense of really getting at our greed. Again, it's not that prosperity is bad, it's not that generating wealth is bad, but when we start to worship that as the source of our liberation power and influence and whatever, uh, it becomes a spiritual problem. And so Amos is warning us against that. This is why God has the red line to the prophet, because of course the king isn't going to say anything about it. And what Amos finally tells them is, you are living in such an asymmetrical way that all these things you're building, you're not going to enjoy. Someone else is going to live in this new house you built. Someone else is going to sleep in this ivory bed because this is not sustainable for the long term. So that's the prophetic critique from our first reading this morning. And we would imagine that when we get to the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus would keep beating that drum and Jesus would warn us against a kind of injustice and Jesus would warn us and he speaks about dishonest wealth and then he tells us this parable and it's like, Wait, so he wants us to do what? Like, what is he saying exactly in this parable of the dishonest steward? It's actually a great story where a guy didn't have an HR department. You know, so rather than walking the guy out with a box of his stuff, he lets him stick around. And he's already been cooking the books, and guess what the guy does before he leaves? He cooks him a little bit more. You know, so they go, this is bad HR policy. You really should have had him leave the property as soon as you knew. Gotten his key and credit card and everything else. But that's not what happens. He gets a report, and then the guy decides, look, I'm not, I'm not going to go do manual labor. I'm, not, I'm too proud to beg. Uh, I've got to keep making my car payment, so I've got to figure something out. And what he decides to do is he decides to use forgiveness as an investment strategy. He says, I will forgive people, and they don't even owe this guy the debt. That's the best part. He's forgiving other people's debts that he has nothing, he has no stake in it. He has no collateral. He's just the guy with the books. 
He says, I'm going to use forgiveness as an investment strategy. So when I do get kicked out, I can go to that guy's house and go, remember how you used to 20 jugs of olive oil? That's probably a month. Can I sleep in the garage, the cabana, the pool house? Just let me have the extra room. And he does this with enough people that he thinks he's created a retirement strategy through forgiveness. Now, the interesting thing about it is his boss hears about it and his boss doesn't go, how dare you? He goes, dude, that's a pretty good strategy. And we might imagine that maybe if he's a dishonest steward, he might have a dishonest boss. We talk a lot about corporate culture. We talk about how it is that people at the top set the thermostat and temperature for everyone down. You know, and you hear horror stories about different companies and how there's like being in a gladiator school to work for this company or that company, but it all has to be done for the sake of competition and development and so on. Uh, and so we imagine the corporate culture of this group is pretty unhealthy because they're not interested necessarily in cultivating integrity and virtue. They're interested in maximizing profit at all costs. And so this is what we see in that story. And the boss goes, not a bad idea. I probably would have done that too if I were in your position. And we would think that Jesus was going to rail against it and be like, don't do that. Don't be like that. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, do that too. This is one of the surprising things that Jesus says. He says, if this is what the children of this generation do to each other, why aren't you, the children of light, equally as creative in how you deal with the world? It is a surprising message from Jesus when sometimes we think that the Bible just sort of strikes one note, like, oh, I know what they're going to say. Don't, don't do that. Don't worship wealth. Um, and you should understand, too, that the word they use for don't worship wealth is the god mammon. So it's literally almost actualizing, creating a kind of demonic idol to worship. But we don't talk about mammon very much anymore. It's probably the entire constellation of worship practices of mammon are pretty much, if you spend time in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, it's probably the predominant god being worshipped in Southern California is mammon. Uh, the idea that you can get security, liberty, freed from problems that affect other people through celebrity and wealth. I mean, that is totally the currency of Los Angeles, Hollywood, Beverly Hills, if you've spent time in that world. And not everyone's involved in that, but it is a tempting alternative to the kind of relationship that we talked about last week, the sort of open-handed vulnerability that trusts in God. But if, in fact, God is the primary deity in life, if, in fact, we are going to use our prosperity, our wealth, and our uh, abilities in God's service... This is part of what Jesus is asking us today, which is be creative with how you respond to the world. Sometimes people think that Christianity is turning your brain off, turning your imagination off, and that's the exact opposite of what Christianity is supposed to be. We are supposed to liberate the possibility of human imagination to say, what would we do if we dealt with the world like this guy did? What would we do if mercy and forgiveness was our strategy for investment and relationship building? and even future security. You can think about it architecturally. You know, even people that have no religious interest, they go to Notre Dame and they go to St. Peter's Basilica and they go visit all the cathedrals of Europe when they take their backpacking trip or they go on their cruise because they are inspired by why would people build something this big? Or what were they thinking that they spent 200 years on one building? How could they be so cohesive in their beliefs? You know, we can't even be cohesive in our beliefs over three or four years in terms of getting various things done because everything's so uh, churning all the time. How is it possible they did this? I'll give you an even better example. I could use the group I'm going to talk about tonight from Chicago, uh, but I'll use a different one. I've told you this before. I and my wife, uh, but mostly me, uh, most of the time, uh, are champion seat fillers. People love to call us when they have a seat. It doesn't matter, and it's not even at dinners or, you know, I've done it at casinos. I've filled seats all over Southern California, places, seen people, heard stories. And someone called and said, look, I know it's last minute, but would you like to come and hear this person speak? This was this week. Uh, and we said, yeah, no, we, that's not, because they're our friends. And we said, well, even if the speaker's not good, you know, we'll have some wine and tell some tales and uh, have fun that way. And um, it was a Korean pastor, and he was a very humble a uh, humble man, and he had had a child who was severely disabled, and he raised the child, and the child was essentially bedridden for his entire life. But it opened up a new dimension for this pastor's existence, 
because he realized that there were other people that were having disabled children who were either overwhelmed or weren't sure they could handle it and they were just leaving their kids on the street. They were just abandoning their babies. So he came up with something at his church called the baby box, which was like a mail slot where you could leave a disabled baby in the mail and then the church would take the child in and try and find families to adopt. Um, and by the time we saw him this week, he had saved over 2,000 children. He had adopted nine of them himself. And it was just this little guy. He's not, if you met him, you wouldn't even give him a second look. He wasn't charismatic. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't beautiful. You weren't like, oh my gosh, I want to be, follow this person. But when he spoke, even when he spoke so gently, uh, there was something charming about it. There was something that made you want to listen. And he didn't set out to create a movement. He just thought, what if for this next moment I opened a creative space for God? What if I just opened a little space in my life to take in the suffering of another person? And now there's this huge ministry and they've turned it into all sorts of resources they're offering. And um, it was actually a very inspiring that was one seed I was glad to fill. That's not always the case. But what I wanted to challenge you with is Jesus himself seems to be frustrated that the people that have the most riches, which is the message of the gospel, are sometimes the least creative, the least active, the least passionate. And so he's telling us this story about dishonest wealth because he goes, even if you have dishonest wealth, use it to accomplish something good. And in this case, if you have the riches of God's kingdom, you should really be using them. And that's why this image of using forgiveness and mercy as a strategy of relationship building, of door opening, of space creating, is exactly the blueprint for the church. Be creative, be passionate, be wildly reckless with how you use God's forgiveness and mercy, especially for other people. This is what he's challenging us with, and it is a surprise, and it is something that we might not feel comfortable doing, but we might as well practice it and see what happens with a sense of hope. He doesn't do this as a kind of life strategy that he himself did not practice. It's not like Jesus did it and then someone had dinner with him afterwards and says, well, how is that supposed to work? And he goes, oh, don't bother. I just do that for my job. It's not what I really believe. This is how God deals with the world. This is how God dealt with the unjust society of Amos. This is how God deals with every culture, people in place that doesn't worship or doesn't hear. That's one of the videos the kids will see tonight from one of these uh, people who walk the street is I show love to everybody. Whether they're innocent, guilty, perpetrating, victims, my message is a message of the love of Jesus and I'm going to be a presence of Jesus in my neighborhood and in my streets. And that's why when Jesus goes to the cross and says, it is finished, the Greek word for it is finished, which is just one word, is the same thing you would put on an invoice to say paid in full. It's as if God is stamping the violent history of the world with his mercy and forgiveness. It is, the, it is an economic term that Jesus uses to describe the canceling of international debt across space and time. That's why for some of you, when you learn the Lord's Prayer, they didn't say forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses. They say forgive us our debt, as we forgive those who are debtors to us. And in a world like ours, that functions with various kinds of debt, that's something I think we all understand very clearly. What it means to be in debt, what it means to have debt paid off, what it means to live in a world where people may be crushed by debt or have opportunities through the various ways they are freed from that. This is the vision that Jesus has for his church. And so children of light, the Lord is calling on you and on us to be creative, to be reckless with God's mercy and to see what happens when we open up this space for God to be present among us here. Amen.